Hey, this is Trevor from Halifax calling in to say that I support creative control on Patreon because I think long form arts journalism is a crucial part of music culture and there's simply not enough of it out there today. Vish is a master interviewer. He lands great guests and he has his finger on the pulse of the ever changing music landscape, both here in Canada and abroad. For all of these reasons and many more, I think you should support Creative Control on Patreon too. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. I'm Bisha's wife and I will love him no matter what you do. And now he has me on the record saying that. Sandro Perry is an ingenious songwriter, musician, producer, and singer currently based in Toronto, Ontario. After a long stretch of not releasing his own records since 2011, Sandro has been rather prolific of late. In 2017, he and Craig Dunsmere put out their second record as Off World and appeared on this show to discuss it. Then, the next year, Sandro released his critically acclaimed solo album, In Another Life, which prompted him and I to have another talk. And as we speak in the fall of 2019, he has just released another wonderful and heralded new album called Soft Landing, which he celebrates with a release show at the Transac in Toronto on October 27th. All of these albums are available via Constellation Records, and Sandra and I met in Toronto recently to discuss Soft Landing, his exploration of the guitar, how time works, and much more. A part of the E1 Podcast Network with the support of listeners like you who subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control plus in-kind support from CFRU 93.3 FM, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton. This is the 504th episode of Creative Control, featuring one of my favorite people and musicians, Sandro Perry, with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Sandro. Hi, Vish. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. It's good to see you. Yeah, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me so soon. (laughs) Well, you're very prolific. It's hard to... (laughs) You have to come back every time Uh, you make a thing. I'm just worried I might not have much to say. Oh, really? Yeah, but I said that last time, too. And we had a a lovely chat. We did, yeah. We're setting ourselves up up for failure right now. I know. It's it's good, actually, to keep the bar low, because then you (laughs) always come away feeling better. (laughs) One of the the narratives around your... uh, presence these days mm-hmm. if i may mm-hmm. yeah floodgates opening right you were kind of quiet it felt like for yeah. how many years between records were we 18 like, or something no like that? that's no? not true no. you, you put out a record called uh what was it impossible spaces yeah. what, what year was that uh end of 2011 11 mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. subsequent to that yeah. was it the uh what what happened you know just kind of life took over did a bunch of work uh, for a lot of other artists in the studio, kind of learning how to do do that stuff. Uh, a little bit of touring, not much. And then all of a sudden, it's 2018. <laughs> so that's the thing. You're a public uh, person on some level, if I may. And so people My, assume... Yeah. Well, you, mildly so. No, you are. You are a so, public yeah, person. Yeah, Your work yeah. is public. Right, it's right, a right, publicly yeah, accessible. Yeah, it's, and it's available. Your absence is noticed. Yeah. By the general public. That's kind to hear. That's yeah. surprising. <laughs> but yeah. So that's, even though you're working as diligently as you possibly can be, yeah. it's not the records. We're not right. hearing the records. Right. So then when did we first talk again since 2011? Was it for the off world? We did. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So 20, what was that? 2016? 16, 17. Yeah, when did 19, that record come out? I don't remember. I think that one came out in 2017. Okay. So yeah. then that's when we talked. I think 
Thank you. For that <laughs> so you that and that was a more of a how would you describe that? Project? Like a collaborative record with. Um, well, we taught it was you, you and I and Craig Dunsmuir, yes. right? And um, but there were other people involved in the record as well, several others. And so yeah, it was that's part of an ongoing collaborative thing that right. kind of rolls out as it's as it rolls out. I guess you could say. And as I recall, yeah. when you make a record by Offworld, you're drawing upon tape from the past. Yes, sometimes. In, yes, in those two, in the in the first two, yeah, it was all stuff that that was sitting on my hard drive or various hard drives. And I guess there is a third one that is cl- pretty close to ready, I think. And that's all. Yeah, that's all stuff from the past. So drawn well. from the past. Right? Yeah. So. It's not that uh, you necessarily suddenly made a new thing with Offworld. It, right. You're drawing from the past. Right. But then the next year, yeah. and I'm talking about 2018, I believe, <laughs> right. yeah. we had another chat, <laughs> yeah. just you and me, just us. on uh, yeah. about your excellent record in another life. Thank you. And that was fun. Yeah, it was fun. We laughed a lot. We did. We did. Yeah. We talked about things right. that I don't think you wanted to talk about in some ways and things mm-hmm. that I wanted to talk about. But, right. then, yeah. but then we talked about things that you wanted to talk about, and it was great. It's a right, nice balance yeah. of... Yeah, we balanced it out. <laughs> <laughs> so that record, was that called from the past, so to speak, or were those like fresh expressions? Well, it's kind of, I mean, I guess it's kind of obvious to say that when a record comes out, it is already the past, it's right? True. And, the, and, yeah. the, and the material kind of generates or is generated, or in my case, sometimes over the course of several years. Right. Like I might spend several years working on a song, and it's not that I'm constantly working on it, but I may do some stuff and then put it away. And then a year later say, oh, I have an idea for this thing. And then and then before you know it, it's like, oh, this song took four years to write or something. You pretty much have a band now, right? Like a fixed membership? I do, yeah. It's pretty fixed, yeah. So a lot yeah. of bands yeah. will get together yeah. and they'll work on their songs. Then they'll go do some sessions. Yeah. Generally, they may bang everything out in a couple of sessions. Yeah. That's not the way you and your group work, though, is no. it? No. I'd, I'd kind of like to work that <laughs> way, but for whatever reason, my brain doesn't function that way. It tends to, um, like, I'll come up with an idea, I'll work on a song, I'll work on a batch of songs that maybe are written around the same time, mm-hmm. but it doesn't feel complete until... Like usually a record to me has to be thematically. Yeah, conceptual to some degree. Yeah, Yeah. So, and I don't always have all of the pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, Like the first few pieces may come, and then it could be, again, a couple years later until the the final piece arrives. And you're you're just talking about a... No, you're talking about an album there, but that, yeah. I feel like you could, is that true of songs even? You could also say that, yeah, about songs, lyrics, for right. example, sometimes, you know, work that way. They reveal themselves over time. And so I just tend to wait until I get all of those pieces or enough pieces that I feel like it's ready to finish and and present to the ears of the listeners, whoever <laughs> they may be. God bless them. <laughs> you say... Uh, with some more than a degree of self-awareness that this is just the way your brain operates. Yeah. Do you have a sense of where that sort of comes from? Is it a, is it overthinking? Is it mm, a lack of easily being satisfied by what you come up with that you contemplate and refine things so much? Oh, that's a good question. The only thing I think, the only insight I think I have is that for whatever reason, I decided at a pretty early stage and, and you know, the quotes, the career, my career. It's a career. That I wasn't necessarily going to operate in the, in the usual cycle fashion of writing, recording, releasing, touring, and then, you know, back to the, back to the top. You decided this. I decided that. Yeah. Based on experience? Uh, based on. Or perception. Perception. Yeah. yeah. It just kind of felt like it's, that was not the thing that I wanted to do that, I noticed that creative impulses kind of came in erratic. Uh, they they revealed themselves in erratic ways, and I wanted to just leave room for that thing to happen as it, uh, however it would happen. And I also realized that I what that performing was not at the core of my practice. It was more the writing and the recording, and that can kind of happen anytime. 
Performing you know. or touring specifically? Yeah, touring, touring. You like yeah. playing shows, I think. I do, I do, but in small amounts. Right. Yeah, small doses. This is something yeah, that so. um, David Berman recently said when uh-huh. he was talking about, uh, or no, he said it to me, sorry, he said it to me in 2008 when we did an interview. He said that. He said he really never understood why uh, people who were writers took to the road and yeah. he also thought his favorite songwriters their skills diminished because of all the road work they were doing right if you're a writer you yeah. need to be in a place where you can write a yeah. state of mind where yeah when inspiration strikes you can seize yeah. upon that you Absolutely. have the same sentiment i would totally agree with david yeah on that, on yeah. that one yeah. yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. i i i like before going on a tour i always think oh i'm gonna bring my note my notebook Right, because I'll I, I want to do some writing. Yeah, never happens. It's always just like, where can I get a sandwich? Absolutely. Where you're, is the best coffee? You're just trying to survive. You're just trying there. to survive. You're, yeah. yeah, you literally are yeah. in survival mode, yeah. and that's not really so conducive to to writing right. to being open. And you know, I'm sure some people do it. It seems like hotel rooms. That's where some writing Ideally, happens, yeah. but. It's never never worked for me. Well, you also have so. to get to your next. Depending on where you're touring, you yeah. got to get hit the road. Yeah, yeah. got to hit the road. I was thinking about this. <laughs> 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 I was thinking about this on the drive uh, in to see you today about how um, all of the music I've made with people uh, wouldn't it be nice on some level to have a practice space where mics were set up and every idea was captured so that if you wanted to develop something, you had a reference point mm-hmm. and where where are we sitting right now actually this is the this is the studio that uh, mike o'neill and i share yeah and it's in the synology building the synology studios building the complex mm-hmm. if you may <laughs> if you will if i may um and it's uh located in downtown toronto pretty downtown so my um, the reason i raise this mm-hmm. beyond just setting the scene um is there a part of you that got into a record record engineering and producing because you are a creatively impulsive person? Like this notion to have the luxury of having this yeah. space when you're like, you know what? I have an idea. Yeah. I'm just going to try it out. Maybe Definitely. I'll even call my friends in and we'll just try this idea. Yeah. Is yeah. that part of why you got into that? Definitely. Having a space um having a space that is just there and available for you mm. really helps to open up something in your creative your the matrix of whatever is going on, you know, the things that you think about whether they're creative or responsibilities throughout the day or you're worrying about the future, you're think, you know, once you have a space, it kind of I think unlocks some some access to a place in your creative being that you just you know that there's a place for you to yeah. go and try yeah. things out and and uh, it just makes it that much easier you know are, and you, a, are you a demo person like do you make demos um per se? i have made demos yeah usually usually i'm i end up feeling like the demo is the magic the thing that that's where you captured something that's and, what i wondered about that yeah. given the i'm trying to home in on this impulsive thing that i've attributed yeah. to you all of a sudden which I've never really thought of before. <laughs> but there is something about the music you've been making, particularly yeah. of late, that has that instinctual feeling. Mm-hmm. This feeling that it's it feels a little structureless, which tells me you're following the moment. Yeah. If that makes... I don't want to sound too cheesy about this, but mm-hmm. it feels like that is conducive to the recording experience to capture yeah. it quickly and then to trust that. Yeah, I feel like a lot of us... I was just having this conversation on the show with... Uh, I think it was with Ben Cook about how he makes a de- he's working on someone's demos, uh-huh. and it just struck me that it's funny that people still make demos in this day and age where you can just put everything right. online right away. Right, right. Um, yeah. But there is this special feeling, and, and what he was saying, and I don't know if you have this, is that I think you just said it. The demo is actually their favorite thing. Yeah. And then you're you're in a weird mode where you conjured and created something out of yeah. thin air. And then you're you're like, but that's not the real thing. Yeah. And then you try to copy. Yeah the feeling it's so messed up so that's it's why so when i ask about demos like you just yeah. said it you just nailed it yeah. sometimes your demo yeah would be perf- and the other thing about demos is sometimes people are like i'll just make a demo on a boom box yeah. or a four track yeah and then when we go to the studio i'll yeah. make the real thing right 
Yeah. You are in a weird space that way. Your demo could potentially be recorded as well as your proper thing. Absolutely. So does that happen? Absolutely. Yeah, having a studio kind of minimizes or even potentially removes that gap between demo and proper thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh and which is good. Anything to help remove that gap is 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 helpful, I right. think, to the creative process. And uh yeah, it's crazy that that happens because it I think it's really just insecurity. You do something that came out naturally, you weren't thinking about it, yeah. and then all of a sudden you're assessing it and you judge it and you feel that it's not good enough for the world and that the world needs a more polished version of what you're doing. Yeah. And usually that's not what the world needs. I feel like the world <laughs> needs to see the, you know, the more impulsive uh, uh, elements I think of it, creative work doesn't it feel like we're all the most keen these days to consume the most unmediated that's and right. raw content that's right like yeah. with the the, the mainstream um, outlets you know they put together their beautifully packaged things but the realm we're engaged in right now podcasts yeah. I mean they really started as these unfiltered yeah, uh, direct access to your favorite people, and yeah. and and they're letting their guard down, and yeah. there's no time limit, and blah blah blah. Yeah. So I think that's just we've all consumed that way now. Yeah. Um. I, and I used to think this started with DVD extras, right? Outtakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Features like yeah. just the way why like the these yeah. reissued albums yeah. where they're like here's the Beatles album that you loved. Yeah. But fifty other songs, With all, yeah. and and you're like, well, who is interested in that? Well, it turns out a lot of people are. A lot of people are. It's very process oriented. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating, and it's a way to connect as well. I yeah. think it's a connective tissue for for people to see um, the the warts or whatever, the faults or the things, the imperfections. <laughs> it's, you know? so, it's so weird. We use these digital platforms to uh, and remote digital platforms to really humanize each other yeah in a weird way yeah <laughs> anyway i mean any way we can i suppose yeah maybe is. it's maybe that's the instinct so mm-hmm. the last time we had a chat uh about in another life we got into this thing that you had come up with i, I believe you called it infinite songwriting yeah, yeah, yeah and were you happy with where we went with that the, did you think it got interview? blown out of proportion no oh, oh. this i really oh. wanted to know more about infinite songwriting oh, okay yeah i can't remember yeah, did we yeah. did we get to it I can't remember. <laughs> Can we listen back to I, it right not now? Not right no, now. No, I don't have do it that. in front of me. No. Do you, did you? Oh, I did, think we did. Maybe. Well, ha, did we, it, people ask know. you about that when you did interviews? Um, a couple of people. Yeah, I think it came up. It came up. Because yeah, I feel it's, like it was it's a kind of a curious term, I guess. Was it your uh, invention? I can't recall. More or less. Should I, I'm asking. I'm wondering to myself. Should I take credit for that? Is do I need to? Do I feel I, is like it you, important to take credit? It's for not it? really a credit thing. I just I don't think it really came from anything. Yeah, yeah. You just were you struck upon. I, it was a lyrical thing initially, wasn't it? You just started yeah. writing sub unconsciously. Yeah, I can't. I'm not sure if it's specifically tied to lyrics, but ly- lyrics ended up being a big part of it. Right. Yeah. Right. I ask um, because this new record begins mm-hmm. with a 16 minute song. Yeah. And uh, and it's about time, right? Uh, in a sense, it's yeah, called yeah. "Time You Got Me." Yeah, right? yeah. So I feel like we got into temporality a little bit with the yeah. infinite songwriting yeah. before. Obviously, when you write these longer songs, people are going to be like, "Hey, man, why is your song so long?" Right. What happened? I love it. Your yeah. songs used to be shorter. Sure. Some of them. <laughs> so I guess I'm asking the since we're at the new album is soft landing, beautiful yeah, album. Thank you. Uh, again, it, it takes its time. Yeah. So what is the relationship between soft landing and in another life from your perspective? I mean, we're talking about, again, maybe seven years of not hearing from you yeah. on record. And now yeah. we have consecutive years where every right. year you've put out a record in the last three years. Right. In particular, yeah. your the records under your name. Yeah. Do you see them as being connected? Um, yeah. Well, uh, the the first, I guess, the most obvious connection is that the last two records, this Soft Landing yeah. and In Another Life, available now in stores <laughs> everywhere. Constellation Records, uh, cstrecords.com dot com. for your special ordering needs. <laughs> A good chunk of those two records were recorded I- within the same month. The Actually, same month? The even? same month, yeah, oh, okay. just across the hall in Synology. Oh, okay. So there's that. There's a material kind of connection to the performances. A temporal connection. A temporal fact, connection as well. Same time. Yeah. Yep. So that's the most obvious connection. So so um, as far as the content or th- the 
themes. I think they're connected for sure. Uh, I mean, it made sense to me to have the first song, the long song, be the first one on the album as a continuation from the last one. That was just kind of a nice little thematic uh-huh. bridge. Uh-huh. Um, and it can be read into or, you know, as being thematically linked to infinite songwriting. As far as the the songs themselves on this new record, most of them were actually written before in another life oh. was written. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so You've these drawn are back to your past again. Yeah, these are mo- mostly older songs. Some of them stretch back I think maybe about 8 years or so. Wrong about the rain I think was written about 8 years ago. So 8 or 9 years so ago. So you started making the two records within the same time period. Yeah. But in another life had sort of fresher compositions. It just kind of popped out and it it was like I'm ready. Huh. You know. I'm ready. It was like a voice like, <laughs> like that. Like a Muppet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, Some sort of uh, sentient Pop-Tart, perhaps? It, yeah, it was a Pop-Tart. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you just kind of listen when that, when something, you know, de- declares itself. Then it was, then it seemed like it should come out first. Uh, and I also kind of thought it was like, oh, it's nice after seven years of not doing something to come out with a record with two 25-minute or whatever yeah. long songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just as a way to kind of, it's a little spark of something different, you know. Um, I, I can't recall when we talked about infinite. We don't have to recall it necessarily. Mm-hmm. We don't have to hearken back to our previous conversation. Yeah, yeah this okay. entire time. No, Why are we doing this? I don't know. We're doing. It. I'll just ask this question it's, fresh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even if you've already answered it, I think that's what yeah. I'm self conscious about. Did yeah. we already talk about this? Yeah. Does infinite songwriting from your is is it connected to automatic songwriting? No. Or automatic writing? I automatic it's writing, no. It's but not that's, It's that. not, no. Okay. Not at all. But that's interesting. That's a, You're the first person who's wondered that, well, I think, I, or allowed to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wonder, so if you, these are totally different eras of lyrics yeah. and songs on some level. Yeah. So obviously the processes were quite different. Like, I just wonder if you didn't obviously apply the lessons learned in infinite songwriting for the record that we see as the first record. Oh, yeah, yeah. You didn't right. apply that to Soft Land. No, not at all. Oh, okay. No, yeah. That's why yeah, I yeah, just wonder yeah. how the processes inform each other, but they're quite different. Right. They're different, but I'm not sure how different because um, I think I have a very probably rudimentary or even primitive bonehead approach to songwriting <laughs> which is um, really i never thought of that yeah no i everyone just, thinks you're this very sophisticated guy not at all it seems you sophisticated <laughs> <laughs> um i think like i just get you know a, a a line might come to me and i'll write it down and then i usually don't know what it is about um you know um but i'll just for whatever reason i'll decide if it's worth engaging with or not, if I like it or not, or if it seems like there's some material there to, to mine. Yeah. Uh, and then it just grows from there. And, and again, I I don't have any real techniques for finishing a lyric, for example, like there's so many things that I have that are unfinished and it's because I don't really have any good techniques for getting to the heart of, of finishing something. It just kind of, I feel lucky if I finish something, you know. Or and it, it feels finished. This is all. Or it feels finished. Yeah, finish exactly. is all. Yeah. Your, that's all your. Yeah. Per- that's your perception of your own stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And there, there, yeah, there have been times when I've looked back on something, and I thought, why did I think that was unfinished? You know, it's it's all right there, and and obviously it was just my own block, you know, a, a, or a, or a confidence thing or whatever, you know. Um, and I've noticed that um, in the last, and maybe this is actually part of why it took me so long to get new music out. I've noticed in the last two years or so, a couple of years, that I'm way less hard on myself and, and much more accepting of ideas that come out as they are. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of appreciate them for what they are and don't try to... Um, there's a lot less effort on my part to make things be something that they're not. Um, so you're letting go. Yeah. Letting go, just accepting how things come out, you know, and, 
um, there was a thing that was happening for a while where I, when I started kind of working on some music with words, uh, if a melody came to me, I would think it was not finished or not proper or not usable until there were words to go with it. Right. Like I had this thing where it was just like instrumental music is not, it's not a thing anymore for me. I, everything has to have words to it. And yet you have two instrumentals. On and the yeah. Side. And I, and yeah. I got to a point where I realized how absurd that was yeah. and kind of, uh, you know, unfair to the creative process. And, uh, so as a result, I think things just got a little bit easier for me in a way, in a certain way, or I was able to accept things. And, um, so now, yeah, so these things that have I've been working on for for years, it wasn't the structure that I was laboring over. It was the it was the uh, musical arrangements. And it was really less a case of, oh, this isn't good enough, more a case of what else can I do with this? Where else right. can, where else can this go? And is this in the zone that I feel it could be, you know? Um, yeah, it was more about that and, and it wasn't so much this sucks or I suck or whatever, you know, Yeah, which, you know, that has been a thing in the past. Like I've definitely been pretty hard on myself when it comes to, uh, making records. I want to, I so. want to get back to those musical, uh, arrangement considerations that you just mm-hmm. mentioned in terms of, in particular, in terms of your work as a guitar player, mm-hmm. um, because that's really <laughs> at the forefront of this new record. Uh-huh. Um, but I just want to touch upon something you said about songs feeling finished because it kind of puts me in the frame of mind of finished to me almost has a narrative structure mm-hmm. illusion to it. Yeah, uh, like finished is meaning you you started out with an idea you were trying to convey and you concluded the idea. Yeah, and I think of God bless the fool here as mm-hmm. potentially in that realm as yeah. uh, almost a tale. Right. Um, maybe it's because of the main character right? Um, or main characters in this right. case. Do you feel like these songs, particularly after the Everybody's Paris, when we talked about on the last album, yeah. which had these, it felt very um, comprehensible uh, in the end to me, like uh-huh. what that meant, what that notion was, but uh-huh. it was full of abstraction. Uh-huh. Does this new record, in any case, whether it's the song I mentioned or not, does it feel like it has a narrative aspect to it or bent to it in any way Um, or is it similarly abstract i think both it's ab it's abstracted enough i think to allow room for various kinds of approaches to listening of course and i would say it's less less narrative and more just that there's thematic glue that i that i perceive between all of the songs Uh, they don't necessarily flow in a store there's not necessarily a story tell it like an arc or anything but they all kind of hover around a a central point for me so when you say finished it's not what i'm alluding to it's not like i've told the story here and it's i mean every song in its own way is a story i suppose but i just wonder if you think of it that way in any way or if you ever write in a narrative sense or prose sense i guess not not consciously no no i like i said i'm 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 nowhere near skilled enough to know how it is that i write like i ju- it just kind of yeah. i yeah i definitely i think of myself as somebody uh, the type of writer who resists finalizing ideas be they, whether they're lyrical or musical I don't like the idea. You don't let go. <laughs> no, That's I don't, interesting. No, You're letting go, but you won't let go. Well, I don't. I guess what I mean is I don't like the idea of declarative ah, kind of writing. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, everything has to be finished. You're right. At a certain point, you you do let it go, and yeah. then that's the that's the end point. Uh, but as far as maybe create, you know, creating an arc or creating a story and tying it up neatly at the end. I typically don't think that I'm doing that probably because I think I'm, I don't know how to. And secondly, because I, for that's not what I'm interested in in particular. I like other writers who do that. Yeah. Uh, but that's not my realm of interest. These days it seems to me that you might finish singing and then there might be 10 to 15 minutes of instrumental jamming, jamming to that's the end. Like that's the, it, 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 
resolves itself with music. Resolves itself. But one thing I noticed is that my endings are always very anticlimactic. They're just, they just kind of, they just sign it. Songs just sort of end. Like there's no, there's never any big endings in my songs. I, I feel like this, maybe there's a couple. There might be a couple. Well, this here came there, up but. with, uh, with our infinite songwriting thing mm-hmm. where this notion beyond the lyrics was just letting a, a groove sustain itself. Play itself. It doesn't out. have to be a lot of dynamic shifts in yeah. tone. And I think yeah. if you're in that frame of mind, then how do you end something like that other than it just stopping? It just stops. It has to stop. Yeah. Yeah. For whatever reason. Yeah. It's like the lights come on or the, <laughs> the alarm clock. Yeah. You know, you hear the alarm clock in the morning, you get out of, you know, it just, and that, and then that helps to avoid the pretense yeah, of yeah. narrative. Right. Which I like that idea. I kind of want to diminish the importance of narrative in songwriting. I see. Okay. Yeah. So when you're in the room with the band yeah. uh, and you're doing whatever you're doing, I know you probably spend a lot of time editing and, uh, in in post production, so mm. to speak. But when you're with the band in the room and it's time to end, yeah, you just give them a look. What's the, what's the <laughs> deal? How does this stuff resolve itself? I know it's probably a case by case basis, but is do you have a sense? That you, do, do you tell them? Do you say, "Here's how I think it might end," or do you just play? That's a good question. Yeah, it's different for every song. Right. Yeah. Sometimes the songs they do have endings just because the, the form plays itself out and it's obvious. Um, mm. and yeah, I think, I think this, I think the songs will always have the end point built into them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sort of, sort of in yeah. your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your guitar playing on this record is, um, people have paid, been paying attention to it. I, I suppose on some level it's, it seems to, does it feel more prominent than? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. What, why yeah. is that? We're living in an age as you and I are speaking where I, I maintain yeah. that guitar oriented music is yeah. for whatever <laughs> you just did a thumbs down. So people listening know, uh, it is a harder, um, thing for other people to get behind. This is a very yeah. hard thing to talk about because, yeah. I, I've mentioned this to some people, and they assume I mean that that's because uh, pop and hip hop are more prominent. And they'll say, right. "What about Kendrick Lamar? He has guitar on his band." Right. But I, that's not what I'm getting at. Right. I, right. Right. Okay. Here's a yeah. weird example, and I yeah. don't mean to invoke this. No, this is interesting. Well, you and I are in Canada. Yeah. And uh, there is a music prize in Canada called the yeah. Polaris Music Prize. Yeah. And over the last, I don't know, eight, ten years, however yeah. long, uh, it seems like guitar music it is not being rewarded uh, as much they yeah. have their own it, it's a different jury every year it, it has nothing to do with a particular uh, jury uh, thing except that uh, I mean we're all I'm part of that jury as yeah. well yeah. but I mean I've had conversations with more guitar oriented bands of late and they say right. yeah it would have been nice to get a nomination right. um, and they don't or they don't win yeah <laughs> and I know part of that is a jury honoring underrepresented people and underrepresented right. music. Yep. But I can't help but see it as a signifier of something else. Like critics generally seem to be more interested in writing about anything but guitar music. Right. Yeah. Your your response to that <laughs> with Soft Landing <laughs> is to make a heavily guitar oriented right. record. I'm not saying it was your yeah. response to that, yeah, but yeah, in yeah. the moment that yeah. I'm describing, do you disagree with yeah. what I'm sort of positing here? No, I see it too. Yeah. Yeah. I see it too. And I think it's, for me, it's perfectly okay. Yeah. I think it's, it's great. I mean, I think that the, the, the more, the broader the spectrum of listening for the general population is the better. I mean, hilarious. Sort of ironically, given that it's you and I talking, like you came out in, in making music uh, as Polmo Polpo, yeah, electronic, a, electronic music, yeah. and and Off World falls in that category yeah. to a great extent as well. So you have this in a way you could have uh, <laughs> don't want to say capitalized on what's going on right, right now, yeah, but you yeah. have that yeah. listening and you have that aesthetic already, the yeah. aesthetic that is more popular, and yet yeah. you've gone. Just as, uh, and probably when you were doing that, guitar music was very popular. I think so, yeah. More popular yeah, yeah, than electronic pro- yeah, music. You were right. kind of yeah. more subversive. And yeah. now 
that electronic music, for lack of a better term, or digital music, if you will, is more popular. You're playing guitar music. Yeah. You have an interesting relationship with the zeitgeist and time. It probably makes no sense, but at the same time, the, I think the only thing anybody who is doing some, has some creative interests or some pursuits can do is to listen to their their own their their gut their instinct about you know and and um i mean these things i think these ideas about like the for the zeitgeist as you say or yeah. what's hot in a particular moment that stuff passes really yeah and your I record mean, is it, frozen forever yeah yeah and you look you look back like you can look back on a record made in let's say 1982 you know yeah. actually the cars right are kind of, of a good example yeah I remember when that music came out, not 82 because I was seven, but the, or I do remember it, but I didn't think about it this way. Sure. But, you know, you, you think of it as, oh, this is just what's popular now. This is the sound of today or whatever, you know, and it kind of, it either draws you towards it or you, or it repels you or you're indifferent. Uh, 20 years, 30 years pass, and you're no longer hearing it in that context anymore. You're just hearing it as a, as music, really, as a piece of music. Yeah, of course. And to me, that's the true kind of reading of 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 music. It has to do with how, not whether not whether or not it has longevity, but the longer view on maybe it. Maybe I'm you know? being maybe and, it's simplistic to assume that. Art or music is a reactionary expression. It can. Oh, yeah, I think it is. But I don't think that that's the only way. That or a it's, contextual it's, expression. It's, like, I don't know what the right term is. Yeah. I, no, I, I, I think of it as a contextual expression, but we're yeah. also in a strange time where, I mean, I'm sure some people think of your music as uh, the new, the latest music as some kind of callback to right. a looser, psychedelic right. 70s sort of right. vibe. Yeah. Uh, you know, attributing it yeah. to an era that happens with lots right. of artists, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, well, they're clearly drawing from yeah. the 1920s aesthetic, <laughs> but are they like maybe they're just doing what's true to them? Yeah, it's a, it's kind of unavoidable, and I think it's ultimately not that interesting to think of things that way. Yeah. I, I understand why it comes up, and it's a it's a it's a an entry point. It's a uh, way that um, people external to you choose to frame your yeah uh, work so that they because they think their audience if you will will process what they're saying about it yeah more easily more easily yeah for so sure. but it has nothing really to do with you not really I mean I definitely didn't think oh I'm gonna make a 70s sounding record or something because <laughs> sure. I would actually recoil at the thought of that like I'd, I would never want to sure. make a consciously retro sound anything you know just like I wouldn't want to make something informed by a desire to be seen as very current because I think that that by, by the time you're done, you're not current anymore. No, <laughs> no. These are so, sort of superficial signifiers. Yeah. Uh, I think that we apply to things sometimes, just as a way of, yeah. if someone would be like, "What's the new Sandro Perry record like?" To, and I'd have to come up with a description. And I'm sure involuntarily, I would just say, "Well, it kind of sounds like this, or it reminds me of this." Yeah, and that's Which how is, yeah, that's, that's how we do things. Yeah, sometimes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's okay too. That's normal. Yeah. That's and uh, you know, it's. I guess it's doesn't have to stop there i guess ultimately if you if you listen to something and you connect with it yeah then hopefully it's not eclipsed by that contextual framework that that you put around the music like oh i like this because i like the 70s and you know <laughs> i watched that 70s show sure. and i like and, <laughs> and I, you know like Hopefully, it's not that kind of thing that's packaged. No, in, in, I don't. In a way, I don't think it's that. Um, and I'm not. By the way, has anyone actually? I just brought no. that up. Has anyone actually mentioned the '70s in your work? Uh, I just threw prob- that out there as an example. Probably, yeah. But that, it was totally a random example. I don't yeah, think that's that a, way. Okay. Oh, that's okay. That's. Okay. A- <laughs> I I don't know if this opens up too big a can of worms. Uh-huh. But I actually want to ask you about your guitar playing. Okay. Um, I, I'm thrilled and flattered that you want to ask well it's an origin story Uh, kind of line of questioning yeah yeah. i the last time i saw you perform was in guelph at the um uh the 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 church there the yeah uh, yeah. and i have seen you play and perform many times Mm -hmm. but there was something about that night you were i believe you were seated and you were laying down some guitar (laughs) lines that i was like i didn't know you could do that 
Cool. Like th- it was yeah. a ferocious display of guitar oh. virtuosity, if I may say. Wow. And I know you're capable of various things, but I've never yeah. seen you play that out. And maybe I missed some shows. <laughs> but um, what? Vish? I, I, I probably did. I probably did. I'm busy. How could you? I try to go to as much as I can. <laughs> but my point is, I mean, we would agree. I've seen yeah. you perform many times. Yeah, you have. You've. Oh my God, you have. <laughs> okay, you let's have. just. It's let's always g- nice to look at it and see <laughs> your face. Thank you. Actually, thank you very much. It's always very comforting. Sometimes it's a happenstance. I went to go see Michael Hurley in Montreal once, and right. you were playing with oh, him. Oh, what a night that was! It's like two thousand and six. Long time ago. Five, yeah, six, long yeah. time ago. All this to say, yeah. I, uh, I don't know what's going on. If I did, maybe I'm just forgetting some of your amazing guitar displays no. before. But, but I want to ask about how you got into guitar playing Uh Uh, if you want to talk about maybe things that struck you as interesting from other people and maybe how they've influenced you and then now I want to get to now in terms of the way you are playing out because Mm -hmm. if I'm correct and this seems to be a distinction between your way of playing live now compared to let's say 10 years ago Uh whether you see that or not I don't Mm -hmm. know I want to kind of figure out what's going on with all of that so let's start at the beginning do you recall how you got into playing guitar Yes, a family friend had an acoustic guitar at the house, and I asked them if I could play it. And how old uh, are you at this point? I would have been—I guess I would have been about eleven years old. Okay, yeah. I asked them if I could play it, and um, I immediately was—you know—it was enjoying myself. I was loving it, and I asked them if I could take it home and borrow it. Or no, oh, no. I think what happened was. They said, "Oh, you can take it home and play with oh, it they, because yeah, because okay. we we're not using it." Um, may, I, may I interject? Yeah. What possessed you to want to pick up that guitar? Uh, what, were you I a mean, fan that, of music? Yeah. Already? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I was. A, yeah, I was a big fan of music at that point. Guitar already. players in particular, though, or guitar uh, oriented like things. Like rock. <laughs> you like rock? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's like, that's what the guitar is really. Yeah, for. totally. Like it wasn't. Um, I think sometimes we pick up a thing like that or we're interested in a thing like that because we want to yeah. emulate someone. Yeah. Like if you're like, oh, that Edge. Oh, I, Edge right. is a really good guitar player. Yeah, how do you, how get, do you, that how do you get that sound? Yeah. I'm going to pick up this acoustic guitar. Yeah, when yeah. you're 11, yeah, I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, Whatever yeah. was going on. Andy yeah. Summers. Well, I don't know I don't know why I'm talking about you two and the police no, right no, now. No, 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 no. I just wonder what was in the air that made you think, I want to pick that up and give it a shot. Yeah, funny enough, there were no, I didn't know any acoustic guitar music at all. Oh. So there was no, it, it didn't give me that instant satisfaction it felt actually quite odd and challenging Mm. but just the idea of playing an instrument at that point was appealing to me because i was such a music fan Uh and i don't think i stuck with acoustic guitar for too long i think i migrated to electric in order to try and get some of that satisfaction the tunes yeah or the rolling stone song no, well, it, no, not not literally. <laughs> that's a re- you know what? That's a really hard song to play. Like the uh, riff, the riff. It's really it's really hard to play it with with that feel. Like wow, and to get the right attack, it's a notoriously difficult song to play. I Anyways. think the combo of Keith and Charlie, yeah, as a rhythmic nobody can you can't you it's can't all touch a that feel that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. No, yeah. no. or I mean, it makes sense to them. Uh, it makes sense when they do it. <laughs> yeah. Everything else is clearly a facsimile of whatever feel. Oh, you never hear a good Stones cover band. No. No. No, there's some, unless they totally copy that weird yeah. delayed backbeat yeah. thing that's going on. I no. can't figure it out myself. No. Yeah. Anyway, it's sorry. total irreverence for the one or yeah, for, the, yeah, exactly. for the center of time. <laughs> exactly. It's a very, they also maybe have a strange uh, relationship with time, yeah. just like you. Oh, yeah, yeah they yeah. do. Yeah. So, sorry, um, uh, Satisfaction, electric guitar is so, what yeah, So, yeah, so it was like, okay, how do I get that, you know, get closer to that sound that is, you know, like I was listening to, who was I listening to? I was probably listening to, like, Kiss sure. and things like that at that time. Isn't distortion such a mind blowing thing? It or is over like yeah, gain yeah. and overdrive. Yeah, just yeah. Like, wow. oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Instant. Like it's just like sugar energy. It's just like yet youthful energy. Yeah. And as soon as you get to like the guitar lets you externalize that kind of energy. Particularly for kids who I think didn't like kids like me who uh, grew up in a household where everybody was loud except for me. Right. Like, <laughs> right, right, right. 
Um, so I didn't have a, you're going to get them back. Yeah. I didn't have an aggressive (laughs) vocal, um, relationship to my voice. I don't you know, I didn't know how to, you know, so the guitar becomes that kind of thing. And I think that's pretty common probably for a lot lot of kids who start drums are probably very similar. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it was that. And then I kind of got into classic, like I thought, oh, I should do the proper thing and learn, you know? And so I took classical guitar lessons for a few years and did that, you know? And then kind of my finger it. picking, yeah, yeah, never became really, yeah. really that good at it, but it d- certainly taught me some things yeah. about discipline and and then jazz so was quote like sort of jazz j- or things that were uh, music that was based on improvising became really important to me. Mm-hmm. I remember I think I was twelve years old when a family friend, different family friend introduced me to the grateful dead right and he was and he was like this is the grateful dead this is what they do they play they play these shows and they just play these songs for a long time and they jam on them and they improvise and that was the first time that i heard heard the word improvised improvising right and i didn't know what it meant right and he explained it to me and i thought and i think that kind of set off something in my in my head about music making and being spontaneous and you know, because I had always thought of it as uh, music was what's on record, and the record sounds like they worked on it, and it sounds very, you know, yeah. very polished and arranged. Right. Uh, so I guess that kind of got me interested in jazz because jazz seemed to be the world where improvising happened the the, the most, the most, other right? than the Grateful Dead, other than the Grateful <laughs> right. Dead. Um, jam bands jam bands which uh, at that time didn't exist no, really there no. was like fish hadn't even started right to, you know there's a real negative connotation towards jam bands but at yeah, the same time eventually yeah. people like us love when jazz musicians do similar things yeah yeah it's weird go figure yeah, yeah. i don't know it's some it's a subcultural thing or or, or a, yeah it's getting into like who do I relate to more as a fan base? I think yeah. that's where the snobbiness starts to come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then who, yeah, who looks more like me? Who's right. Yeah, and all that weird <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so, but so, that that freedom appealed to you. Yeah. That notion yeah. of playing free. Yeah, the yeah. idea, yeah, the idea of riffing on an idea and just kind of, you know, um, seeing where you could go with it in yeah. the moment. Right. Um, and even though I wasn't that, I, I mean, I certainly got into jazz, jazz, but I realized pretty quickly I wasn't going to be a jazz musician, but there were things that I had to learn from it. And How do you I, learn you know, those things? Is it primarily just practicing yourself? Yeah. Practicing, studying, reading, listening. A lot of it is listening. Yeah. Just to, listening to records and playing along trying and trying to figure it out. Yeah seeing what sounds like it fits and what doesn't and you know just a really slow process years and years of practicing and and struggling with technique and not not really feeling like i mean i still to this day feel like i can't play the guitar like you, the, the, you know. I, I, this is a weird question to ask after such a statement mm. but do you feel like you know the guitar like do you no. feel no. <laughs> like, do you know where, what everything is, uh, where everything I mean, is, notes and things like that? Kind of, but not really. Hmm. Like, I, f- I feel like... Uh, not a lot of theory in you? I have a lot of... Th- I did study a lot of theory. Right. Yeah, but I don't, I, don't, I don't have a relationship to it that seems like it's the same as what I see other musicians doing with their instruments. Like, I... I f- feel like I see a good guitar player and I get a sense that they don't feel restricted by what they're doing. They can play whatever they hear. Uh, I still struggle with hoping that I'm going to play what I hear. I kind of know Uh, roughly where I need to go, but I, there's still a huge element of risk for me in playing in improvising because I don't have mastery or, you know, I'm not in, uh, in any way, uh, I haven't mastered the instrument. I haven't, un- the, the the term is unlocking the fretboard. Right. <laughs> uh, I haven't unlocked it yet. So um, uh, earlier I made a grand pronouncement about um, how you've been playing out more. Mm, it feels like you're, you're going for it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you agree with that a little bit? Yeah. And, and you made a point of playing a bit more. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Let myself go more. And I do just want to quickly say, I don't associate unlocking the fretboard or that idea of having mastery over the instrument as being 
showy better oh, than yeah. than struggling with an instrument and still playing even though you're struggling uh-huh. like i don't I, there's no for me there's no it doesn't mean that you're making better music because you've unlocked your instrument you know it, it sure y- yeah i just want to clarify that i think that uh you can make wonderful music not knowing kind of not knowing what you're doing on your instrument yeah, yeah. but having a, an intuitive sense of what your musical instincts are telling you okay you know, and being, that's a, being able to respond to them that's fair but yeah. do you, all of a sudden this just got really serious no i don't like. know <laughs> I, I think it's important to sort of get at the uh punk or jazz aspects of yeah what's within you as well yeah uh yeah. it's not simply a matter of being uh a highfalutin player necessarily right. it's still coming from a very um i don't know instinctual and genuine place yeah. it's not simply to blow people's minds yeah. however yeah. i did allude to this like the last time i saw you you really surprised me okay and you blew my mind with oh, your play everyone was like holy shit like that, yeah. that that's pure amazing guitar playing that's sweet so did Oh. Was that a conscious decision on your part to play? To blow your mind? To, yes. <laughs> to play in such a way that people would have to be like, whoa, that guy who was moments ago gently singing, playing yeah. like interesting chords is now mm. suddenly, you know, flying. His fingers are flying and blowing um, us away. What was going on? What's going on there? No, I don't know. I mean, I maybe con- a conscious decision just to open up the music to allow for that if it seemed like it could happen. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yep. And and it's like there's a section here where this could happen if it feels right, but if it if it doesn't then that won't happen. Okay. Yeah. It's just in okay. All right. Well, I mean yeah. that's a fair explanation. I I just mm-hmm. want to encourage people. Are you playing shows? Do you have shows coming up? Just one October 27th in Toronto as a, the record release. I wasn't able to arrange any other cities for whatever reason this time. It just didn't happen, so there's only one release show. Where is that? The transact. Of course. Big room? <laughs> the big room. The big room yeah. and the transact. Of course. I hope it's the big room. Okay. So that's October 27th, which this is a nice segue. What is next for you after soft landing? We've after talked this. about the, the floodgates being open record after record. It yeah. seems what's next. I have another one that I'm working on. Uh, working on meaning what, where, what stage? Of- it's uh, unfortunately, it's not as far along as I, as I had hoped it would be by now, but the music is all written and um i would say a third of it is recorded so i'm hoping that i can finish it by the spring and that it would come out next fall are you consciously trying to put out a record a year no um you said that almost defensively <laughs> no what do you mean <laughs> there's no ulterior motive there's but a, well you seem i like the idea of it if it doesn't happen it doesn't happen I like the idea of it. Okay, here's the thing. I feel like I need to finish it because I because we're getting kicked out of this building. Oh studio, yeah, right. right. So it it does feel important to me to finish it before that move happens. Oh, so I that see. would be the spring. Okay, that's maybe the main thrust of the idea of getting it out. Are you when you say the uh, instrumentation? Sorry, yeah. I don't mean to bypass no, that. No, that sucks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah, I've yeah, already yeah, we talked yeah. about this yeah, yeah. off mic, and yeah. I already expressed my concern and yeah, yeah. condolence for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my you. my point is, uh, what was my point? Oh, my question was: You say uh, the instrumentation is written, the, third of it is yeah, recorded, songs, so yeah. lyrics, if there are going to be any, are to come. Yeah. Are you, is this data bank work? Is this a hard drive work you're calling from or or is this all fresh? No, this is all fresh. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, this is all fresh. Yeah, these are, and and these are mostly, mostly songs that were written in the last hmm, five or six years. Maybe, yeah, similar, similar to, similar to this current one, Soft Landing. This music was written, most of it was written kind of around the same time. Okay, okay. Yeah. So it is yeah. sort of digging into your work, your it's, archives. Yeah, but it's, it's, yeah. Okay. it's of that batch of music that that seemed to be, that that all was written within, yeah, this these last several, five, six, seven, eight years. Okay. Yeah, and, and it's just that now this batch feels thematically linked you know, all these songs feel like they go together and they also feel thematically linked as a, um, not a response, but a continuation of this current record. Are you in trilogy mode? One would think. It's true. That's not a, 
it's not no. I mean, uh, like it, conceptually, do yeah, you actually yeah. see this these three um, aligning? Um, no, no, I wouldn't say yeah okay. because in another life, I don't think yeah, I don't think of it as being like the entrance, the, okay. the, the first part of the trilogy. It almost uh, seems like the last part of the it. Trilogy. Could be yeah, yeah. It's it doesn't make any Maybe sense. Reverse order, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm excited that you're you're working so hard and, and being so prolific. Thanks. Um, people want to learn more about you. You're on all the things, right? You're on Instagram. For what the most on? part, yeah, yeah, I'm on there. Yeah. Twitter and Instagram. Part, yeah, I mean, you're not, on not there. Too, yeah, not too. You don't active. do too much. No, right. No, okay. not too active. Which, yeah, you know, I feel conflicted about that stuff too. You should. Yeah. You absolutely should. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, do you have a website still? I do. I do. Yeah, it's uh, it's still up there. It needs to be updated, but all the all the essential information is there. What's the address? Yeah, www.sandroperry.com. Dot com. Yeah, dot. You went with dot yeah, com. I went with dot com. Sandro yeah, the Perry. original. <laughs> <laughs> and people can go to cstrecords.com yeah. to learn more about. Yeah, this there's, new yeah, stuff, there's stuff there with the record. Tour and dates and whatnot. Uh, yeah, no tour dates up yet because it's well, really I mean, just the one. October, but the October show might be there. It's actually not announced oh. yet. Oh, yeah, the, okay. This is the oh, first okay. Yeah, okay. The announcement. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, if we can go out on a song from Soft Landing, uh-huh. would you mind picking one? Um, hmm. Um, how much time do we have? It's the podcast universe. Oh, yeah. Is infinite. You can just do whatever. You can do whatever I want. Um... I would maybe pick Floriana if if I had to pick one. This is an instrumental. Yeah, this is an instrumental. Um, that song is special to me because it came about with almost no effort. It was it was it feels like uh, it was a gift. I barely f- feel like I wrote it. I barely feel like I uh, can take ownership or authorship, even though I do. Um, it it just kind of rolled out very naturally, and so it's still very kind of sp- yeah. It still feels like a piece of music that I can hear and appreciate objectively. I'm, I'm I'm trying to conjure it in my mind right now, so forgive me if I misspeak here. But I yeah. think of the primary riff as being a horn led riff. But do yep. you also play it on guitar? I can't remember. There's some horn and there's some guitar and there's some on flutes. the primary riff. Yeah, uh, at some point. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, at some point. And who yeah. who played that stuff? So Ryan Driver plays the flute. Uh, Nicole Rampersad plays the trumpet, and John Jowett plays. There's a little bit of euphonium in there tucked in. And um, Mike Smith plays the bass. Yeah. Blake Howard plays the conga, uh-huh. and I think I played the rest. Okay, the piano and the guitar. Oh, uh, yeah. When you name an instrumental tune, mm-hmm. I mean the name can have a uh, have its own meaning. What does yeah. the name mean in this case? Also, kind of just arrived in my brain. I have no real understanding of where that name comes from, but I looked up the the word the name floriana and it turns out that it is a city in the country of malta oh which for whatever reason when i was a little kid i was kind of fascinated by this place malta i didn't know anything about it it was just a random thing i heard i think i heard the term maltese right i didn't know what that meant the falcon Falcon. (laughs) right and then maltesers although i'm not sure those are really related related to malta yeah uh and so it was strange to discover that, oh, this is a city in Malta, this country that I had this passing kind of naive fascination with, yeah. and then, but I never pursued it. You know, I didn't, didn't even look it up. They didn't have the internet back then. And I, you know, uh, so it's just kind of this thing that happened and I thought, oh, that's nice. It was like a gift, the name yeah. and the, and the song as well. All right. Well, so. I'm, I'm happy to, that you've uh, shared it with me. Yeah. So thanks. this is Floriana by Sandra Perry from uh, Soft Landing. And as always, Sandra, this was a pleasure for me. I hope you enjoyed it and best of luck with everything. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Vish. Yes.
Very, very special thanks to Sandro Perry for appearing on this, the 504th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms and Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom as well. If you're looking for an episode on any of those things, you know, you've heard about one, but you, you don't see it there for some reason. Or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my semi-regularly scheduled newsletter, it's very semi or semi. It's not regular. It's semi regularly scheduled anyway if you want to do any of that stuff look for old episodes learn about me sign up for the newsletter please visit my website vishkana.com you can like creative control on facebook follow the show on twitter at vish creative or follow me directly at vishkana you can listen to a radio show version of creative control on wednesdays at noon eastern standard time around the world at cfru.ca or on an actual radio at 93.3 fm if you're in or near guelph also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. It means a lot. And as you may or may not know, there is a new $6 tier. Anyone who pledges $6 or m- more per month uh, has access to uh, exclusives, as the kids like to say, exclusive content that I will be sharing on the uh, Patreon page. So make sure you check that out. Again, patreon.com slash creative control. Thanks again to Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton for their in-kind support for this show. As always, Jim Guthrie. Jim is the best. Go to jimguthrie.org to learn more about the music you sometimes hear a little bit of on this show and lots of other stuff, too. Jim's very prolific. And finally, you. Thank you very much for listening to this episode and uh, subscribing to the podcast and potentially uh, checking out other episodes. I hope you're enjoying it, and we'll spread the word about it. And uh, that's all I have to say for now. I will talk to you very soon. Bye for now.